Welcome back to Long Covid Doctor, an educational series for sufferers of Long Covid. I'm Dr Tim Robinson, formerly a GP for 30 years, now GP lead for three NHS Long Covid clinics and a GP clinical lead in Long Covid across the southwest of England. This episode is on breathlessness and Long Covid. In part one, I talk about the symptoms, uh, diagnosis and investigations. And in part two, I will talk about the treatments, management and outcomes. References, links and resources are in the show notes below. Any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after consider after discussion with your own GP or qualified health professional. And so here we go, breathlessness and long COVID. Breathlessness is a common symptom of long COVID. Uh, as I say, it's sort of the one of the big three, along with fatigue and brain fog. Breathlessness, in my experience, in the long COVID services that I work in, um, is very common and, you know, it has a great impact on many of my patients. So, first of all, the symptoms and associated symptoms. Breathlessness, uh, as is defined, is, you know, being short of breath, the feeling of not being able to catch your breath to feel your lungs, to the feeling of of suffocation that some patients describe. Breathlessness may be experienced only upon exertion, such as, you know, when you're walking upstairs, or it may be with simple activities of daily living, say washing, showering, dressing, or even eating. Or perhaps even just at rest, patients, you know, describe the feeling of being breathless at rest, which they never had before they had COVID. There may be associated symptoms with the breathlessness, such as cough, uh, chest secretions, sputum, uh, throat discomfort, hoarse voice, swallowing troubles. There may be associated chest discomfort, chest tightness, um, like a sort of the rib cage is being constricted and, and sort of um, clamped and with a band around the chest. Um, the so-called COVID grip. Or there, there may be actual chest discomfort or pain across the front of the chest or just on one side. Breathlessness is often associated with sort of fear and panic and this is understandable of course you know it's an understandable reaction if you can't get your breath it makes you feel panicky so then you know what do we do about it okay so you know one step at a time first of all you know we've got to sort of figure out why someone is breathless and actually actually to sort of get a diagnosis so the way we do this is you know just good old-fashioned medicine we talk to the patient get the history the narrative um, and then examine the patient so general history first of all we're looking you know for sort of the features of the breathlessness but like i said it's in order to get a diagnosis specifically looking for possible di differential diagnoses in and that by that, what, what, what do we mean by that differential diagnosis? Um, basically, um, other causes of breathlessness um, other than COVID. So what are those differential diagnoses, those other causes of breathlessness? Well, it might be because the patient has an existing underlying ch chest d disease or illness, such as asthma or COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Or they may have breathlessness because of a medication, such as um, an ACE inhibitor drug. Um, the patient may be breathless because of anemia, for example, iron deficiency anemia in, in, in particular. The patient may be breathless because they've been unfortunate and had a severe 
um, uh, case of COVID and they ended up on a ventilator on the ITU. Equally, they've, if they've had severe breathlessness, um, a severe um, attack of COVID, it may have left them with scarring of the lung and interstitial fibrosis. They may have a pulmonary embolism, um, a blockage, a blood clot on the lung. They may have pneumonia, loba pneumonia, low-grade lo- loba pneumonia. They may have reflux of acid from the stomach up into the sort of the upper upper airways, causing cough and breathlessness. They may have sleep apnea. Um, there's the condition when you know there are absences of breathing interruptions of breathing during your sleep. And finally, they may have a condition called breathing pattern disorder. I'll talk about that a bit later on. So, as I say, history, really important um, to actually find out about other conditions which they may have coincidentally or pre-COVID, which may in themselves produce breathlessness. But History is equally as important to find out all the specific features of their breathlessness. You know, is it only at rest or is it only on exertion or is it, is it posture related? Is it the same day and night? Are there associated symptoms such as cough or pain or, or the phlegm I referred to earlier? Um, and, and in which case, what's it like? What's the sputum like? And is there any blood in it, for example? So having come to the end of the, the history taking and having a sort of a good idea about the various characteristics and and specifics on how the patient is is experiencing their breathlessness, it's next on to examination, routine general examination, with an emphasis on the sort of the respiratory system and the cardiological systems. So first of all, we look at the patient. Um, you know, the patient may look anxious. You know, as I said, you know, being breathless makes you feel a bit sort of, you know, worried, anxious, concerned. Equally, we look for sort of sort of any blueness um, and what we call cyanosis, and that could be central or peripheral cyanosis. We want to. Uh, get a sort of a, a a mark of how breathless someone is by recording their respiratory rate, how many breaths per minute. Um, again, still on observation, are they breathing normally uh, or are they breathing through, through what we call pursed lips, you know, um, where they've got their lips fixed and they're sort of using their lips to control their breathing. Um is the breathing shallow or does the breathing you know appear sort of deep and uh and the talking about the rate is it rapid or is it sort of slow and gentle breathing and then the doctor would want to have a listen to the chest with the stethoscope and to listen for any any wheeziness any sort of um crackling that would suggest heart failure um, any rubbing that might suggest a blood clot on the lung. Cardiovascularly, the doctor will want to do, to measure the pulse and the blood pressure, look for signs of heart failure, ankle swelling or um, raised jugular venous pulse. And then to sort of quantify the respiratory system, I think we would want to see what the sort of the oxygen saturation is. So you can use a pulse oximeter on the finger, um, preferably not a smartwatch. Um, the readings are notoriously misleading. I've had many patients report a, you know, a very low blood oxygen level with their smartwatch, but when it's reproduced using a proper pulse oximeter, it's normal. Um, resting oxygen saturation should be more than 96%. Um, uh, and if it's not, you know, then that's perhaps uh, 
a, an indication that um, referral for um, a respiratory opinion might be indicated. Whilst you've got your pulse oximeter uh, on your finger, it's um, a handy way of um, assessing the assessing what we call desaturation with exertion to see just how you cope with exerting yourself and that is sitting to standing sitting to standing on a repeated basis over one minute the one minute sit to stand test and if your oxygen level drops by more than three percent or certainly less than 96 percent uh uh uh, more than more than 96 percent or less than 96 percent um, after doing that test you really ought to be asking the opinion of the respiratory uh, specialists there are other things that the gp might do consider to do in the gp surgery so peak flow and spirometry specifically looking for sort of the breathing efficiency, the lung capacity and elasticity of the lungs. Um, so all good markers and routine tests in the surgery uh, to investigate for breathlessness. So that's history and examination uh, out of the way. Like I said, in order to arrive at a diagnosis. Um, but the other thing we've got to be on the lookout for always are red flags. So those signs and symptoms that suggest something more sinister. So red flags that we'd be sort of on the lookout for in a patient who is breathlessness, breathless would be a sort of an unexplained um, associated cough that is new and it's been there for more than three weeks. That is a red flag. Um, unexplained weight loss, blood in the sputum, especially if the patient is a current or previous smoker, any massive or progressive weakness. Um, all of these, you know, we, we're all on the lookout for as red flags because they could well be indicators of something more sinister, like I said, such as a lung cancer. Um, so any of those red flags should be actioned and usually it results in a referral to the hospital doctors to specialists other red flags that will make you suspect say a blood clot on the lung or such as you know uh, a problem so i.e pulmonary embolism um it would be a sort of sharp one-sided chest pain that's sudden onset um associated with recent bed rest or swollen calf you know those are red flags for pulmonary embolism so you know referral to the specialist in the hospital would be indicated so that's history examination and red flags what happens thereafter well again in general practice your gp would want to be doing the baseline blood tests and these are the baseline blood tests that were, are recommended by nice on nice guidelines for long covid and you know you'd be wanting to do a full blood count you'd wanting to do a a liver and kidney um function tests you'd be wanting to do blood send blood for crp and ferritin looking for inflammation again the routine bloods that are on the nice guidelines for long covid patients and they also include um, thyroid function test and HbA1c for looking for diabetes, BNP for looking for heart failure. Another blood test that is frequently requested by long COVID clinics is the D-dimer, um, which is a marker of um, blood clot. Um, but beware, it's often, there are often false positives so your d-dimer can be positive but not only for blood clot but after infection or lung injury or persisting inflammation anywhere else in the body can all, all lead to increased d-dimer so you know or because your d-dimer is elevated it doesn't necessarily mean you've got a blood clot likewise you can have false negatives so i've seen patients with 
with um, pulmonary embolism and also indeed microclots, um, much talked about, quite controversial, um, with a negative D-dimer. Uh, other tests need to be done if you're really concerned that there's a high likelihood of either a pulmonary embolism or a microclot. And then, of course, you know, the un other investigation, which is obvious really in, uh, in anyone whose breathlessness is breathless, is a chest x-ray. Um, acute COVID shows this sort of ground glass opacity, opacity, opacification, um, you know, but it's not necessarily present in patients who have had mild, um, uh, mild, um, non-hospitalization, uh, COVID. Um, so again, but, you know, I think it's, it, it should be in, indicated by anyone with breathlessness or, you know, certainly other associated symptoms such as, such as, um, uh, cough. We mustn't be sort of COVID blind and, you know, or because someone has breathlessness, uh, and COVID, it must, we mustn't sort of be complacent and think, okay, because they've got breathlessness and, um, uh, and they've had COVID, it must be all due to the COVID. Other conditions may, um, be present. If the patient is then referred to hospital, then they may have more, yet more tests, yet more specialized tests, such as a high resolution CT scan, a VQ scan, ventilation perfusion scan, a CTPA, sensor CT scan, um, palm, with pulmonary angiography, looking for blood clots. You may have heard of the xenon, um, gas MRI scan, which shows, um, hidden lung gamut damage, e even in the presence of a normal CT scan. But this is really just research, research purposes only. They cost a thousand pounds a go. Um, and so, like I said, it's only been used for, for, um, research purposes. And really, it only comes up positive for those patients who have really had a, a really severe, um, bout of acute COVID. So not the majority of our long COVID patients. The other tests that is often done in the hospital setting are respiratory function tests, the um, transfer factor, DLCO they call it, diffusing capacity for lung for carbon monoxide. That sort of measures the passage of oxygen from the air sacs, the alve alveoli, into the blood. This is reduced in inflammatory conditions and, and also blood clots. So that is the whole sort of plethora of of investigations that can be done in any patient who has breathlessness breathlessness due to long covid but obviously you know it's a case of tailoring the the case to the um uh the case to the investigations that need to be performed not all patients will have all those uh, exhaustive exhaustive exhausting list of of investigations that i've that i've uh um uh listed there so having uh, you know excluded the differential diagnoses and the red flags we're left with the diagnosis of fatigue um sorry breathlessness due to long covid like i said we don't want to be covid blind i just as I, as I, as I sort of, um, explained, you know, or because you've got breathlessness, um, and you've had COVID, you've got, it's all due to, all due to the COVID. No, there may be other differential diagnosis. And for so, uh, but from so having excluded those, uh, from now on, we can make the diagnosis of breathlessness due to long COVID. Um, so what are the causes for breathlessness due to long COVID? I think it's important to know the causes because it helps the patient understand and hence accept the problem. Um, it also reminds the patient of the complexity of long COVID and that all, 
all the things that can go wrong with long COVID. And hence the reason why um, fixing it is never going to be possible by doing just one thing. And so what are the possible causes? What uh, we can call, what we call the pathophysiology for breathlessness in long COVID. Well, hold on, there are lots. So the COVID, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 infection can cause all sorts of damage, damage to the lung structure. So that can lead to sort of scar tissue, um, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, scar tissue within the, within the lungs themselves. Uh, the COVID can lead to damage of the lining of the air sacs, the alveoli. Um, and so there's a barrier, uh, for oxygen to transfer across the, the alveolar wall, um, and into the alveolar capillary blood vessels. So oxygen is not passing across the, the those those tissues into the bloodstream. Covid can cause excessive inflammation uh, of the blood vessels, the 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 alveolar capillary blood vessels. So inflammation of the of the blood vessels themselves. So endotheliolitis. So as a as a link in the in the resources in the show notes below, which um, demonstrates that very, very well in a study. I, again, it's blocking the oxygen passing from the air sacs into the blood vessels. The oxygen, the blood is therefore not being oxygenated. And then there's the whole story of microclots, the mini clots that can occur anywhere in the body. Very difficult to detect. Um, again, if you've got blood clots in the, uh, in the blood vessels, the, the network of blood vessels surrounding the, the air sacs, oxygen is not going to get into those, those blood vessels. Uh, and blood is not passing through those blood vessels. So oxygen is not going to get carried away, uh, from the lungs to the rest of the body. Again, there's another link in the show notes below um, that talks about this. Then there's COVID uh, infection that's can causing lining uh, inflammation of the lining of the lungs. I sort of hinted at this earlier. So inflammation of the lining, that's called pleuritis. That causes sort of discomfort with breathing. Um, the patients call this the COVID grip. Um, and there's reduced air entry into the lungs if you can't take a deep breath because you've got COVID grip um, of your lungs. You can't, you know, basically take a full deep breath and then that's going to cause a sort of, sort of a subjective feeling of breathlessness. COVID can cause a dysfunction of the immune system. So autoantibodies have been found. So antibodies against your own normal cells have been found against that, that, uh, sort of act against the, the, um, the cells lining the, the air sacs. And then there's, there's also dysfunction of the, um, carotid bodies. These are the sense organs in the carotid artery. Um, oxygen can set concentration in the body, uh, uh, that that sense the oxygen concentration in the body and drive respiration. If those cells are damaged, that then causes dysfunction of the normal breathing pattern. So, uh, and there's more, you know, the virus can actually affect the heart muscle causing myocarditis, which then can cause heart failure, which is then presents as, as breathlessness. But you can also get breathlessness due to general body deconditioning in any severe illness. And finally, you can get breathlessness due to anxiety and breathing pattern disorder, um, in which there's sort of shallow, rapid breathing due to worries, anxiety. Um, like I said, you know, 
being feeling breathless can cause uh, cause sort of worry, but also worries can cause breathlessness uh, because you tend to breathe fast, breathe shallowly, um, not breathe efficiently. So, as you as you can tell, it's very complicated. One person may have one of these processes going on, leading to the breathlessness, or they may have a number of these processes going on, or they may have all of these processes going on. All of them can contribute to breathlessness. So it's little wonder that long COVID causes so many symptoms in so many systems throughout the body. It is complex. It is, as I say, as I said before, it is the perfect storm. So there's that's the first that, the first part of my talk on breathlessness and long COVID. It concludes the first part, um, uh, the symptoms, the diagnoses, the investigations, and the pathology behind it. In the second part, I will talk about the treatments, the management, and the outcomes. Um, so I hope you've found that helpful. Um, as I've mentioned at the start, my any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own GP and qualified health professional. So in the meantime, I wish you well and I wish you well with your long COVID recovery. 